Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for letting us remember what you have done for us and remember the ones that's given their life for us as well, Lord God, that served our country and are still serving our country today. Lord, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear that we may hear what you've got for us today. Give us a heart to receive it in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. Amen. <clears throat> Remember last year, was it last year I guess? Uh, we had the guy from Chosen People Ministries come. And unfortunately, they uh, we had a major storm come through at the same time. Tornadoes and everything coming through. And instead we had... Had it advertised all over the TV and read, not TV, but all over the radio and everything else. People calling all over, trying to, hey man, when, what time is that start and everything? And then of course all the tornadoes coming through the whole place. And but we came anyway. There was about six or eight of us here because of the storm. But praise God, uh, that was last October, September, October, something like that. But uh, it was a great thing. But I still received their. Their newsletter. That's the one that uh, that Dawn went to Cuba with on her uh, uh, little adventure over there. So praise God. But I get their their thing, and they have this this week. Of course, the chosen people is representing God's people, the Jewish people that are now born again, putting their faith in Jesus Christ as the Savior, as the Messiah. Uh, the nation of Israel as a whole has not received Jesus as their Messiah, as their Savior, but uh, there are a bunch of them that have, and they are re remembering here on this memorial weekend and everything else to remember the Holocaust and what happened. And he's got some things in here I just wanted to share with you because it's so powerful uh, I wanted to share that with you. Of course, this is from uh, a now elderly man that is the president of the Chosen uh, People Ministries. And uh, he is obviously a born-again Jew, a fulfilled Jew, or completed Jew as we call him. So this is what he writes. The United States Congress established May 2nd as Holocaust Remembrance Day. Many of us have, have expanded this to the entire month of May and are holding various lectures and memorial services to commemorate this terrible moment in Jewish history. As a Jewish person, I grew up under the dark shadow cast by the Holocaust. Of course, he is probably in his late 70s by now. So he knew the people that went through the Holocaust. Uh, my grandparents were pre-Holocaust European Jewish immigrants to the United States. They came before the Holocaust came from Europe. Like so many others, they never talked about those tragic days. They did not walk through it personally, but knew a lot more than they would ever tell us. Perhaps they wanted to spare us from the horrific details of this nightmarish chapter in Jewish history. I was raised with photographs of my aunts and uncles that I would never meet because they died in the Holocaust. I can't imagine what it's like for the survivors. There is a lady here on the coast that goes to one of the local churches that is a Holocaust survivor. She's got the tattoos of her numbers on her arms. Uh, and so she knows very well. She's European. I forget where she's from, Austria or something like that. Still has a thick accent, but she's a strong believer in the Lord, but went through that horrible thing. He goes on to say, God's grace is sometimes hidden in the midst of life's greatest difficulties. Wow, isn't that something? How would we know unless we've been through something tough? Tragedy opens our eyes to his presence in ways that good times never will. It's during the difficult times that we recognize he is always present and powerful and that even death and destruction cannot keep us from him. Wow, that's a strong statement, isn't it? That it's always when we go through the tough times that we recognize he's there. We get to get complacent, don't we, whenever we're going along, things are going great and all that kind of stuff. We tend to just go, oh, well, that's all right, and, and forget about it. Just like we just sang, our hearts tend to, to wander away from him. This is why the Apostle Paul 
writes so powerfully in Romans 8, 38, 39. He says, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from it. It doesn't matter what insane people like Hitler or anyone else does, people that try and attack us personally, no one would ever do that, would they? Well, yeah, they would, wouldn't they? Unfortunately, yeah, that's a shame. But they do, but nothing can separate us from the love of God. And, and we sometimes wonder why in the world are we going through things? And he points out very clearly from someone that has gone through some of the worst times on, on, in history. And he said that these are the times when we have driven to the Lord. Driven to see what he's doing. Because far too often we just cruise on through this life. Not even realizing what he's doing. That's why I keep saying, Lord, you're doing stuff we don't even know about. Mm -hmm. uh, even when times are going good, we don't even have a clue what he's really up to. He's still working on our behalf. He says, it is good to remember the Holocaust and evil intent Satan has in mind for God's ancient people, for the Jewish people. The devil still wants to destroy the Jewish people to prevent God's promises from unfolding. This should motivate us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and to remember His grace in the midst of life's difficulties. It does say for us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Amen. And they're even today going through amazing... It's hardly ever brought up on the, the, the mainstream media, on the news at night, if you watch the 6 o'clock news or whatever. Rarely is it ever discussed that there are constant barrages of missiles going over, constantly, back over, constantly coming in, all the time, day and night, all over uh, Israel, right now, today. And the only time the mainstream media puts it out there is when the, one of their things gets through and uh, Israel retaliates. And they don't mess around. They can see exactly where it came from, and they go bomb them real good and trying to get rid of these maniacs. And, of course, then the evening news is, oh, my goodness, all these innocent people were killed. And they forget about literally thousands of rockets every year that is shown going into Israel. It happens every day. And it's, it's hundreds, if not a thousand or more, so far this year that have gone into, into Israel. Isn't that amazing? My goodness, what craziness is that? He goes on to say, we never lose hope, and that we must never lose hope, as he is still Lord and in control, even though humans and Satan himself are guiding humankind on a path to total destruction. Wow. Even though humans and Satan himself are guiding humankind to a path of total destruction. Look at the things that are going on. I mean, this world has gone mad. It's gone insane. They're doing things that we never dreamed of uh, when I was a child. Of course, it's been a while now, but still. I mean, just in my lifetime, the change in the attitude of this world is just overwhelming. And the things that are now thought of as acceptable were not even talked about. But now, everything, there is nothing that's off limits. Uh, he goes on to quote Romans 11, 25, 26. For I do not want you, brethren, to be misinformed or uninformed or ignorant, is what the whole Paul King James says. Ignorant of this mystery, so that you will be wise in your own estimation, but uh, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fulfillment of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. So right now there is a, a partial blindness to the people of Israel that they're not understanding who the Messiah really is. But there are those that are coming to know him and got to the salvation that he's got. Now, there is... 
He's got some uh, old things. This place has been around since uh, 1885, I think, they started this, this uh, ministry. And so he's gone back in his archives and looked at some of the things that uh, some of the different newsletters and everything like we've got right here over the years. Starts with the uh, May 1938, right in the midst of the Holocaust, right in the midst of, of uh, Hitler going crazy all over Europe. And this is what they wrote in their newsletter to their believers into the Jewish nation. It says, Dear, Dearly beloved friends, Sorrows fill our own souls as we read of the calamities that have befallen the Jews in the present hour in Austria, in Germany, in Romania, in Poland. Here is tragedy beyond the power of pen to describe. We've seen the pictures, right? And, and even Schindler's List. Anyone ever see Schindler's List? Oh my goodness. Uh, and that was a tr based on a true story. Now this man went and tried to, to grab people out of that, but the people literally, bones with skin hanging off of them. And how in the world they survived is just amazing. Uh, he goes on to write, a friend in Vienna wrote us, of course very guardedly, just a glimpse of what had been going on in the terrible Nazi push by which Hitler suddenly seized Austria. We in America, although undergoing our own Hours of depression and suffering still know too little of what the agonies, what are the agonies of this harassed people. On the day of the swift sweeping down of Hitler upon Vienna, the Jewish population was panic stricken. I can't even imagine. But, and again, showing it on Schindler's list, you see how they were just going, oh, what do we do? Here they knew that they were being hated and constantly had to put a patch on, a Star of David's, and saying Jew, or Jude, J-U-D-E, is what there was in, in uh, German, I guess. But they were panic-stricken. They were caught like rats in a trap, for they had no warning of the impending disaster. Immediately, they threw together what, what few things they could, and then began an exodus, such as perhaps took place on the night when they were delivered out of Egypt, they start trying to head for the hills as fast as they can, grab whatever they can carry, and run for their lives, literally. The roadways out of Vienna were choked with Jewish men, women, and children, packs on their backs, hurrying to escape from an Austria gone mad with Nazi hate for the Jew. Suddenly, all frontiers were closed. And these poor Jews only found that they must return to whatever might await them. The roads, they close the roads off. You can't get out. So they had to turn around, turn around and go back to whatever was there. The trains were crowded with the better class Jews who had gathered together what possessions they could and were rushing likewise to escape. At every frontier, the trains were stopped. Every Jew was dragged out, searched down to the skin, stripped of every possession he had. The Nazis boasted that they had thus collected over 20 million marks, or be like dollars in the, in the Jewish, <clears throat> in that area anyway. 20 million, can you imagine what that was back in 1940, uh, 1938 is when this was written. 20 million. They, confiscated all their money. Uh, that would be like, I don't know, $100 million today or something like that. <clears throat> then they loosed these hapless Jews and told them they might go where they would. Just let them go. Okay, you're done. We got everything that you own. They took the clothes off their back. Now you can go. Go wherever you want to. Of course, they knew that that wasn't going to last. Then here's another one from June of 1939, the next year. Our nation bleeds. It bleeds in Germany. It bleeds in Romania. It bleeds in Italy. In fact, it is hard to find a land under the sun where Jewish blood does not run like rivers of water. The Jews of the world are terror-stricken and run hither and thither and do not seem to know what to do. Rabbis keep stuffing them with false hopes 
and they mislead them into blatant demands for certain rights as to Palestine or other places. All these tactics only make matters worse, and the Jews find themselves sinking deeper and deeper into the quicksands of world hate. Yet the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not dead. Praise God. They are, he is proclaiming God is not dead. The God of Elijah is not dead. Our fathers, the patriarchs and prophets, turned to God in time of trouble. They obeyed his word and God delivered them. Remember all through the Old Testament, they'll get away from God and they do like we were again, we were just singing. How we want to go off and do our own thing. And they would do it. And they would repent. God would send forth some kind of a calamity on them. And get their attention. And they would come back and he would, he would uh, set them free again. Deliver them again. Let us also turn to that God. And do what he told us to do. Obey his only begotten son. The Lord Jesus Christ. And then having done all. In humble childlike obedience to him. We can with the fullest confidence, look to him for deliverance. If the word of God is true and if Jewish history counts for anything, when that hour comes, the world will witness the most wonderful salvation that ever it has seen in 6,000 years of hectic and bewildering history. Wow. And it did too, didn't it? This was 1939, 1947, 40, 47, 48. They, uh, they came as a nation. For the first time in some 2,000 years almost uh, since they had been a nation. <clears throat> then in August of 1939, this is an excerpt from a radio broadcast uh, here in Atlantic City, New Jersey from a First Baptist Church in Atlantic City. He goes to say, and now I come to the message which I hope will be helpful to all listening, especially to you Jewish people. We're living in an age when giving offense seems to be the order of the day. The Bible says give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. That's 1 Corinthians 10.32. God's word says give none offense, and yet offense is being hurled at all these days, especially to the Jews. We pity the ungodly Gentiles and the professing Christians who are giving offense to the Jews. My goodness, people proclaiming to be Christians and speaking out against the Jewish people. They are disobeying God. And all who think and act contrary to God's word and will are bound to suffer great loss. The word of God cannot be broken. Therefore, all offenders of Israel will be cursed. Saith the God of Abraham, I will curse him that curseth thee. Genesis 12, 3. We have been showing all along in these talks that there was a vast, is a vast difference between Gentiles and Christians. Wow. One thing that characterizes a, gen, is a, gen, a Gentile is hatred toward the Jewish people. The opposite characterizes a Christian. So whenever you meet and, or hear a person who displays hatred toward the covenant people of God, you can know that he is a Gentile and not a true Christian. Wow. No matter what his religious profession is, a true Christian is a believer and follower of the Christ of God. And like his Savior, who was a Jew, has love in his heart for those that, uh, that Christ referred to as my brethren after the flesh. Jesus was Jewish. We all came from their religion. Amen. We just accepted their Messiah before they did. I want to impress upon you this morning that even though persecution against you in the, on the part of the Gentiles, the world over is on the increase. He's talking to the Jewish people again. Uh, persecution against the, uh, you on the part of the Gentiles, the world over is on the increase. God is working to, it together for the good of your nation. God is working it together so we can understand again for us. When we go through trials, God is working it to the good. He knows exactly what's going on. He hasn't he been caught by surprise. Oh, my goodness, I didn't know that was going to happen. No, God knows exactly what's happening. And he is working it out for the good in us. It causes us to turn to him. You're going to do one of two things. I remember years ago, 
the, there was an old man that, uh, that kind of adopted us, so to speak, and uh, we brought him to church, kept trying to witness and to him and everything else. I brought him to church, and it was at an Assembly of God church, and it was one of those Sundays where everything was kind of going a little over the top, you know, people running around the church and everything else and, and shouting and hollering and everything else. And I thought, and I thought, oh, Lord. And he said, well, he's either going to run to it or run from it. But he'll make a choice today. And I went, wow, okay. Hey, let's see what he does. It's up to us what we're going to do. What shall we do with Jesus? What should, that's what uh, Pilate asked. What shall I do with, with this Christ? And the same question that comes to us. He chose Jesus that day. They gave an altar call. I saw him sitting there watching through all the calamity and everything, everything that was going on. Uh, and I thought, while well, I was watching, he was, he was leaning forward in a wheelchair. He had only one leg and half a foot on the other leg. And uh, they gave an altar call, and I saw him looking and listening intently. And I uh, reached over and said, Jim, do you want to go up there? I said, I did. And he brought one, he starts doing his chair. And I run around back there and grabbed his chair and pushed him up to the front, and he gave his heart to the Lord that day. Uh, so we're going to run to him or we're going to run away from him one way or the other. It's the, there's no other choice. You can't be on the fence. He says, you, you're either for me or you're against me. So we need to know uh, what we're, what, whose we are. Amen? Amen? He's working it out for good uh, out of the world of world wave of anti-Semitism that is forming into an international program with the alleged purpose of driving the Jew into racial suicide. But the Gentile of Jewish hate does not know the Jew. He does not know that the Jew is an old veteran in the business of surviving persecution. Wow, is that ever true? My goodness, there are bad, they've been through this so many times. And see, we need to understand the same thing. We do not, in this world, you will have tribulation. We need to understand it and say, okay, Lord, but rather than go through a long extended period of time of, of all kinds of uh, bondage and everything else like they ended up doing, and then finally, okay, it got bad enough, we cry out to the Lord. What if we start learning, okay, Lord, what's going on here? I need to know. And we can start learning and building each and every time something comes up. Hey, my God's in control. He's working things out for good for me, even though it doesn't look like it to me right now, but he is still in control, amen? From Haman's day to Hitler's, to the Jew has been persecuted, but he is still here in far, in far greater numbers and strength than ever before. The persecution which is now going on throughout the world is helping to solidify Jewish hopes and aspirations to bring to your minds the great heritage of Jewry and to a certain degree to remind you Jewish people in your place in your in the program of God and in your place among the nations of the world so it's solidifying their hopes they know that they're in the midst of all kinds of persecution and it's solidifying their hopes isn't that something I got to another one from from April of 1943 now the world we have joined in and all of Europe is, is involved in it. And he goes to say, what can we do? Over and over again, our friends are asking us frantically the above question. Many of them have been horror struck and sickened at heart beyond their own power to describe uh, when they have been reading the almost unbelievable savageries to which the Jews in the Nazi-occupied lands are being subjected. It makes my heart sick to the very core, wrote one of our friends. And I find myself driven to my knees as I implore God to have mercy. Wow. Driven. What's it done? Driven him to his knees as he's imploring God to have mercy. Does God have mercy? Yeah. Yes, he he's got mercy, praise God, even when it's stuff we don't understand. But what else can I do? 
It does not seem, it does seem that something can be done and something should be done to stop this orgy of massacre and torture. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. That's a letter that was written to these guys. And from the saddest depths of our heart, we can only answer the dear child of God. This is the most important thing you can do. Pray. The most important thing that you can do is pray. In the midst of the trouble, and the, we think we go through little bits of trouble when some little thing happens to us. These people were literally getting their teeth pulled out to get the gold out of it and stuff like that, let alone being tortured and, and murdered and gassed and everything else. We keep on praying, and for God wants us to be importunate in our prayer to him on Israel's behalf. Again, praying for the peace of Israel. For the moment, nothing material can be done. There's no possible way to get money into the hands of, of those miserable victims of demon hate. There is no way whereby we can rescue even one family from the clutches of Hitler's maw. But we can leave Hitler and his horde to the hands of a just God. Whoa! <laughs> Did he get his comeuppance? Yeah. He got, he got uh, what was coming to him. Amen? Uh, there must be a day of reckoning for this unspeakable fury of hate and brutality. So we know that that happened, that, that God rescued them, and immediately, almost within a year after the war was over, or two years or three years after the war was over, they ended up giving their nation back after two or three, or almost 2,000 years. So... He's got one more in here that I wanted to read to you. Now, this is uh, some, one of the things in November of 1898. This is the November of 1898. Some guy, this is the main guy. This is this man's father, uh, Leopold Cohen. And the main guy now, the, the head of it now is, uh, oh boy, is Mitch Cohen is his name, but that's his son. So his father wrote this uh, at, in 1898. At the close of a meeting in Brownsville one Saturday morning, a number of Jews and Jewesses came to shake hands with me and begged me to call upon a sick Jewish right away, a lady. They said she is in a critical condition and has expressed several times a great wish to see you. Now they knew that he was a Christian that he was a born-again believer. When I reached the poor patient, I found her in a very miserable condition, a baby lying beside her and her husband holding another one in his arms. Two babies, two children, so this is obviously a, a young woman. Both man and sick wife began to cry when they saw me come in. Wow, you ever had something like that happen? When you walk in and someone is in real hurt and they see you and they, and they just get the reaction, oh man, it's a relief is what it is. They see help. I went to a, a, a friend's funeral a few years ago uh, and uh, I went to school with him, good man. He got off into stuff sort of like I did and then he got saved and uh, was serving the Lord for the last 20 or more years of his life. and. Uh, and I went in there, and I went to school with his wife as well. And she was going through the, through the, I was standing in line to go through the receiving line. She was standing by the casket there. And uh, when it came, she would come and turn around and look for the next one. And it would be an old friend, you know, a high school friend or something like that, or family or something. And, uh, and she would just come over and you'd, they'd have some nice small talk and talk for a second. And when it came my turn, she turned around and saw me, and she just froze and turned around for a second and gathered herself. And I walked over and, and put my arm around her, and she put her head on my shoulder. I didn't know her that well in school, but that's been 50 years ago, too. But, and she just started weeping, and I just started praying the peace of God over her uh, because here she is mourning for her husband and uh, they, were, they were my age, so at the time we were about 65 or so, maybe even about 64. 
And uh, so there she was mourning, and all I could do was pray the peace of God over her and comfort over her. But that's what she needed. She didn't need small talk. She need, didn't need something about, oh, he's in heaven now, and everything's wonderful, and all that kind of stuff. She needed peace right then. So they did, she did kind of like what she, the, these people were doing. Let me read that again. Both man and sick wife began to cry when they saw me come in and the wife for joy over my visit and in courteous welcome tried to sit up in bed, but she had not the strength and fell backward upon the pillows. <clears throat> now there were many Jews and Jewesses in the room and the Holy Spirit constrained me to offer prayer in the presence of them all. I first explained to them in whose name I was going to pray. <laughs> you get a bunch of Jews, and here you are about to pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the Messiah that they have not recognized. And the Lord, the Holy Spirit, constrained him until he explained what he was about to do. And who he was, and that I had the experience that God answers prayer in the blessed name of the Lord Jesus Christ. While praying, the Holy Spirit of God took hold of these Jews present and troubled their hearts so much that they asked me what they should do in order to obtain a good knowledge about the Messiah in whose name I pray. <laughs> the praise God, he prayed, he explained to them who Jesus was, he prayed in it, and he told them that he saw the power of God move when we prayed in the name of Jesus and as soon as he was done, what do we need to do? I need to know what I need to do to get saved. I need to know what I need to do to recognize him. He says, I marveled at the movement of the power of the Holy Spirit upon the hearts of these men. And I said in my heart, how wonderful are the works, are thy works, O Lord. My goodness. <laughs> when we go and do what God tells us to do, did you think God set up that meeting? I think he set up that meeting with them, don't you think? And uh, he went in obedience to what God told him to do. And uh, all of a sudden, the Lord God moved in a powerful way, and a whole bunch of, of uh, Jews got saved that day. Amen? That's power. That's the power of God's word and his love for us. So... I had to share that with you as a memorial, right? This is a memorial day, and this is what the people that sacrificed their lives, and even the ones that came back maimed and, and hurt physically, many of them came back maimed and hurt in their minds and in their hearts for the things that they saw. So, But this is what they gave their life for, is to give us and give them victory and, and uh, power to live in this world and God delivered them and brought them back through such a horrible, horrible thing. And it's about to be repeated here shortly as the, uh, as the great Holocaust, the great uh, and terrible day of the Lord is about to come. So, and it's going to happen again. What's going to happen is, is the whole world is going to go through a great tribulation and then God will come back. Jesus will come back. And the Jews at, in mass will come back and realize that's our Savior. <laughs> and God will come rescue us. Amen? So, this is Memorial Day. But, I want to share a, a dream with you. Now, that was all just free stuff right there. I ain't even going to charge you for it. Well, if you want to pay, it's okay. No, no, no. Uh, <coughs> but... Uh, I want to share with you a, a vision that I had, and this was, this part will be shorter than the first part, I think. We'll see. You, you believe that? No, oh, yeah. Okay. You, you know me better than that, right? <clears throat> and I'm already losing my voice, so you might get a, a, a little reprieve anyway. As you know, <clears throat> most of you know, recently we went through a, a bit of an upheaval in some of the things that's gone on in our church. <clears throat> and it was a, a tough time. It was a tough time. We need healing. We needed healing as a church. I needed healing as 
the pastor of this church because the problems that were addressed here recently had been going on for quite a long time, for a number of years, since before I was pastor, and that's been four and a half years ago. <clears throat> so it was, it's been a long, hard time. And all of a sudden, it was finished on one day, right? In one day, all of a sudden, <clears throat> most of the, the, the uh, issues were aimed at me and my wife. And uh, so it took me a little bit, all of a sudden, bang, it's done with, it's over. And it took me a minute to sit there and go, wow, okay, I don't have to come and wonder when the next shoe is going to drop, when, when someone is going to say something uh, about me or to me or, or to someone else or something like that. And I was wrestling with that and saying, Lord, I don't have the power. I don't have the power that I used to have. <clears throat> the anointing has, has lowered its wane. And I was praying Oh, about Thursday morning, I think it was about 5 o'clock in the morning or, or so, I woke up, 4.30 in the morning. I woke up and I was sitting there praying, saying, Lord, it's like I'm being chained up. And these chains, I haven't broken free from the chains yet. These things have still got a hold of me. Now, Cindy has noticed the, uh, since the, the freedom that we've gotten that the power of God is moving stronger in the message and everything but me myself I was still in bondage because of all these things that have been heaped upon me and the chains and everything that have been binding me up for all this time for all these years it's been about six years probably more and I was saying Lord how do I get rid of these things it's, that's what's squashing me and quashing the spirit of God from moving like it should me having the authority and the power that I need to lead the people. And he said two words. He said, rise up. Rise up. And I was just immediately, it was a vision. <clears throat> and you, you see these big uh, uh, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade balloons, these giant balloons. It was like I just blew up. And these big, heavy chains all of a sudden became like thread as I rose up. And they just broke and fell to the ground. And as I rose up, the power and the authority and the freedom came to me. I knew the freedom was there, but it took me a while to realize it. It's been about three, four weeks now, four weeks or something, if that, three weeks. And, uh, but it took me a minute. I'm saying, Lord, but when I rose up, the power of God came back. And the freedom came back. And now I can come up here not wondering when the next shoe is going to drop. You know, not wondering what's going to happen that I'm going to have to repair uh, when someone, something is said to someone else. So I wanted to share some scriptures with you about what the Word of God says about to us to rise up. And I really, really appreciate you guys that have risen up already. And said, I want to help. I want to do something. Show me what I can do. Show me what I can do. I appreciate that very, very much. And uh, we'll get to, to, again, this is part of me catching up a little bit. So <laughs> I'll get caught back up. As I am caught up right now, as a matter of fact. So let's see what the Word of God has to say. Acts 26, 16. But rise and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for, for, for this purpose. My goodness. He is telling this. This is written, of course, to Paul. Paul is recounting his salvation when he got knocked off the horse, right? And the Lord Jesus appeared to him as a blinding light. And he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus, and you're persecuting me. And the Lord showed him what he needed to do. But he told him to rise up. Get off your feet, get off your butt, <laughs> get off your butt and do something. Get up on your feet, rise up, and I've appeared to you for this purpose. God Almighty is telling us to rise up and not stay down in the bully grubs, not stay down stuck in the clay, 
He says he rises us up out of the miry clay. He picks us up out of the miry clay. And not like that old red clay I saw on a minute ago. You get stuck in that stuff, you can't get out of it hardly. The blue clay is even worse, it seems like. That's like concrete gets stuck in it. But he raises us up out of that. He picks us up out of that mess and gets us free from all that and washes us and cleanses us because we get stuck down in there looking at all the crazy things that's going on around us and all of a sudden we get free from it. It's like, oh my goodness, wow, I can walk. I can walk again. Rise up and stand on your feet. I want you up and moving and doing what God has done. For the, I, I've appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness to both the things which you've seen and the things which I will yet reveal to you. God Almighty has risen and is telling us to rise up. Did he rise? He rose, praise God. That's why we have the victory. He rose from the dead. He beat death. And he's telling us, okay, now we died to self. Now we've got to rise up just like he did. Rise up and get on your feet. And he is calling us to be a minister. Calling you to be a minister. Does that mean you're ever going to get up here? I don't know. Uh, it may not be. Not many people do, right? I mean, if it were, we'd have 42 ministers in here, right? Uh, what good would that be? We tried that before and it didn't work. And this whole thing kind of fell apart in a hurry. But you can't have that. That's chaos is what it is. But he's calling you to rise up and stand on your feet to make you a minister and, uh, and a witness. This is what I've seen. This is what I've seen. It goes on to say, for the things which you have already seen, right? And we have seen God do so many things in our own lives. That is what he's called us to be, is a witness. What you've seen, the witness testifies of what they've seen. And he's already shown us, all of us, each and every one of us, many amazing things in our own personal life. He showed us many, many things that have happened in our life around around ourselves and what God Almighty has done in His Word. He shows us and opens our eyes to what He has done, the, the, the truths of His Word. So He's calling us to do that. And the things that I will yet reveal to you. He's going to show you more and more things. If you've been saved more than 10 minutes, He's shown you more and more things. And you've grown and grown and grown and grown and grown. It's amazing as we go through this life, the different things that we learn and get it down inside instead of just this head knowledge. Well, I read that and it said, that sounds good. Well, I don't really like that one. But it never gets into the heart. And you sit there going through things over and over and over again. All of us do it. Uh, I don't care who you are. Until we finally get it down in here. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, wow. I don't have to sit there and have my feet bogged down in the clay any longer. And stop. I can rise up above that junk. I can rise up because he is showing me new and new things. He's revealing more and more of himself to us constantly, all the time. Look at this. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. I'll deliver you from all the people that are oppressing you. Everyone that was oppressing him. He was oppressing the Gentiles. Uh, he's now delivering him from the Gentiles that he was going out to kill, right? Paul was going to go kill these people. And he's going now that he knows that they're, they're uh, not going to want to have anything to do with him. He's going to deliver him from that, from their very much uh, uh, standoff. And doesn't go on, Don't come around me. I know who you are. Uh, but he's going to deliver him from that and deliver him from the Jewish people that are going to go, wait a minute. That's the guy that we used to send out to persecute these guys. And now he's gone and been one of them, so now they're going to want him dead too. These guys will send out someone to ambush you and kill you, literally, right? So God is telling you, I will deliver you out of everyone that comes against you. That's what he's telling us, that he will deliver us out of the hands of everyone and everything that comes against us. So... And what's he doing that for? To open their eyes. The world needs their eyes open. Uh, it's ridiculous what's going on in this world, but they're not even raising their children in churches. 
But people today just have no idea anything about church or the Lord or anything because they don't even grace the doors of the churches any longer. And now the kids are grown up and they have absolutely no idea what the Bible says, anything at all about the, the Word of God or anything. The morals they get are the ones that they're being taught in school, right. which is almost none, and being taught at home, which again, they're telling the kids to figure it out. Telling their kids to figure out what's right and wrong. They're kids. They're children. We have to raise them up in the way that they should go. But now it's let them do anything they want to do, and they they got to figure it out. There are many, many, many of them are telling them to figure out whether they're a boy or a girl. What <coughs> insanity is this? Talk about going over the top. That's so over the top, it's ridiculous. Way beyond ridiculous. I mean, telling a child, a three, four, five-year-old, well, you make your decision whether you're a boy or a girl. Not a hard decision to make. I mean, you teach them. All you got to do is look at the anatomy and you can tell. And they'll mutilate their bodies and make them look like the other, but they're still a male or they're still a female one way or the other. God created them a certain way. And their genes, their uh, genes will tell them exactly what's, what they are. But to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light. They need to be turned from the darkness into the light. I was in much darkness. And he turned me to the light, praise God, to let me know that the, you don't have to live in that. I remember when I, when I first started to run away from the stuff. Of course, mine was in the late 60s. And it was all peace and love, right? And it wasn't either. You know, it wasn't peace and it sure wasn't any love. But... Uh, it was all great for a couple of years, and then all of a sudden, everybody started going really berserk and, and doing all kinds of bad things, stealing from one another and everything else. And I went, wow, this is really dark. It went from all everything's beautiful and all this kind of stuff to everything was really dark and nasty and, and horrible things going on behind closed doors. And I thought, i gotta get, I got to get out of this. i got to get away from the darkness. And I ran to the army, went and joined the army. Only problem is I did not realize that the darkness was in me. <laughs> I was just bringing it with me. I just changed location. That didn't do me any good. I needed me cleansed. So in order to turn them from the darkness to the light and from the power of Satan to the power of God, I needed to be given the power of God to overcome the power of Satan that had me bound, that's really bondage, that they may receive forgiveness of sins my goodness, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me wow I'm so glad he forgave my sins, my goodness as I was doing everything in, in, that you could possibly imagine. I, I had every drug known to man in the other room that I was selling to anyone that would buy them at the time. And he immediately said, I'll take him. I was like, what? Are you kidding me? How could you just say, I'll take him? But when God Almighty says, I'll take you, I'll take you. So he forgave me my many, many sins. And he gave me an inheritance among those that are sanctified by faith in Jesus. Amen? Amen. So, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we've got a body, we're walking around on this earth in a physical body, we do not war according to the flesh. I was trying, and we can try many, many times to try and settle these things on our own. I'll take care of this guy. I'll go over here and do this, and I'll go and do that, and, and let him know what's, what's, uh, what's what. And if we want to, we go over and uh, smack him upside the head and everything else. Doesn't work that, that, that way, does it? It just doesn't work. We're not warring against the flesh or, or according to the flesh. We're not wa warring against flesh and blood. We're warring against principalities and powers. So, when we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare 
are not carnal, something we can figure out on our head, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Man, oh man, I need that the strongholds pulled down in my life. And you need the strongholds pulled down in your life. I had to rise up and pull down those strongholds that were chaining me down, pulling me down. Many things pull us down here in this earth. Some things we can't get away from if it's something that, that you know, if, if this is your parents or your kids or whatever's going on, doesn't matter. But we still need to rise up. And we're not fighting against the flesh and blood, the other person. We're fighting against principalities and powers. And our weapons uh, of our warfare are not something that we can take control of and go to. I'll go take care of this. I'll go do it. No. does not work. But they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Casting down arguments. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought captive uh, into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Casting down arguments. Do you ever have arguments with anyone else? Yeah, sure, everybody has. I don't care who you are. You always have arguments. But we tear those things down. We cast them down. We tear them down. Say no more in the spirit realm is where it happens first. If it doesn't happen in the spirit realm first, it's not going to happen here. Because that's why it doesn't get any better. You're going to go and start arguing. I'll argue better. And I should have said this. I'm going to go back and say this next time. Whatever they say that. All you're doing is escalating it higher and higher and higher and higher. And it's getting deeper and deeper. And the heat gets turned up hotter and hotter. I don't like that. Been there and done that? I have. Ain't no fun. And But we're not doing that on our own. We pray and we tear those things down in Jesus' name. Casting down those arguments. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. People that do not know the Lord, we're coming to, to try and minister to them. And we're coming against that and giving them whatever they put, their, their high brain. You know, Sister Beryl always used to say, our big brain. You know, get rid of the big brain and we can be all right, you know. But praise God, the, our brain, our mind, they try and exalt ourselves. We try and exalt ourselves above what God knows and what God says. As if we know better than he does. Doesn't work that way. So we tear down that thing that's exalting itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity. Into the obedience of Christ. I need to stop and go, wait a minute. What am I doing? Am I doing that to someone else? No, no, no. I'm bringing my thoughts into captivity. I'm saying I will not think like that. I will not allow that to rule and reign over me. I'm not going to have myself going, well, I'm, I can, I'm going to go over and, and say this to them, and I'm going to go over and do that to them, or anything else. No, 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 Lord. I'm not fighting this. Again, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. We're not arguing and, and fighting against one another but we're fighting against spirits and we need to do that in the power of God most high and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I can be ready to punish all disobedience but I've got to be obedient first. Where am I, when I'm obedient to Him and giving my life over to Him then, ah, then I can go and say, hey, this is what God says. But we can't do that until we have obedience in our own self. So, today, we rise up and say no more. We will not allow this. We take and, and pull ourselves up. He rises us up. He gives us the power to rise up in victory over all the things that chains us down. I've been chained too long. <laughs> I've been chained too long. And many of you, well, all of you have been chained too long too. 
we all go through times in our lives where different things just chain us down and it gets such a heavy thing where you can barely walk, it seems like. But, praise God, he tells us to rise up. And all these things just fall off. Like, like it turns to this big heavy chains turned into spider webs and just fall off like silk. So praise God. That is the thing that we need to be doing today is rise up. Is what he's telling us to do. In Jesus' holy name, Lord God Almighty, we come to you and rise up in you. Rise up in the spirit, Lord God. Breaking free of all the things that hold us down and all the chains and the encumbrances that tear us down and hold us down. I break those in Jesus' holy name. I tear down the strongholds according to your word, Lord God. All these strongholds, all these chains are broken now. No more in Jesus' holy name by the power of God most high. Lord God, now that we are in obedience to you, now we can come against all these things and tear down these things of disobedience. In Jesus' holy name, we are free, 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 and nothing can bind us any longer, Lord God. Now we rise up together. I rise up as the pastor of this church, thanking you, Lord God, for the authority and the power that you've given me. And thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters here today that the chains are being broken as well. I declare it in Jesus' holy name. You told us that we have the authority, and I'm going to do it right now. In Jesus' name, I break the power of sickness. I break the power of diabetes in Jesus' name, and I command it to be loosed from my brothers and sisters, off their bodies. You lead them now in Jesus' holy name. It's a lie out of the pit of hell, and we will not stand for that to be chaining them down constantly in their diet and in their bodies. I break those uh, encumbrances in Jesus' mighty name. All these people with all the different issues in their bodies, whatever it is, sickness, disease, pain, aching, whatever it is, I break all that in Jesus' name. It's loosed. You said, Lord Jesus, what we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And we, get, we loose it now in Jesus' name and command it to be gone. Uh, children, I speak and say in Jesus' mighty name they will be obedient to their parents. Uh, in Jesus' mighty name, the power of God move. And I break those encumbrances. I break those things that are causing these things to happen. Oh, Lord God. And the, the eyes that have been closed, I command them to be opened in Jesus' name. Rise up and look. Look up for your redemption draweth nigh. Today is the day of salvation. Open your eyes. I command them to be open and the light of God most high to flow in right now. And Lord Jesus, we will give you the glory for you're the one that opened the door. And But you said that we can walk through that same door. So we're doing what your word tells us to do, Lord God. Thank you, Father, for setting us free, setting me free, and setting this church free. No more all the lips speaking against us. I bind shut and say no more. You have no more power over us. Anything that's done against this church, I bind the hands and command them to be loosed from us. And I bind their hands together. You will not talk about us one, uh, once again. You will not touch us in any way. And Lord God Almighty, we are free. We just saying we are free, free, free. Free indeed, Lord God. You have made us free. We thank you, Lord, for victory here today in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Now, if there's anyone else would like uh, some prayer, I see hands going.